board and group think about our conferences. And if you remember, we've asked uh, several as to what, you know, what really is the information and the people we need to bring to our conference to, to, to provide in the pursuit of the goals of being good enough to fix them. And when we started planning this conference this time of year, we knew that the general election would coincide with our conference. Uh, so with that in mind, we thought about going out and trying to find some of the best minds in the state of Oklahoma that make their careers in studying the political science as to what happens in the state. You couldn't find any, but they got us instead. Uh, <laughs> The search was long and diligent, but we did find a couple that not only do they have the full speed of what we think the political future for the state of Oklahoma is, That's true. but they also have a, a feel for the same issues that you deal with out here. Uh, let me state for the record, I feel a little bit like Elizabeth Taylor said, uh, I, I really know what to do, I'm just struggling with a place to start. But, uh, I think we've got a great place to start this morning. And I think that our theme was the day after. And the day after the election, and where's the world going to go from here? And we have two great special guests today. Uh, they have distinguished themselves uh, throughout the state. They have been involved not only in their church and their schools and their communities, but they've been elected officials, just like the people in this room. Uh, the first person I'd like to introduce on my left uh, is Kurt Humphrey, who is a past mayor for the city of Oklahoma City. He was elected in 1988, re-elected two years ago. 98, yeah. 98. I'm old, but not mayor, that old. One yeah. of the architects of the MAP program that actually changed the community in many respects uh, by investing a a public investment of $300, $300 million. They leverage that into now over $4 billion worth of capital investment in, down, in downtown Oklahoma City. Uh, along with that, he has been very engaged in education formation, uh, not only in Oklahoma City, but in other parts of the state. Uh, probably his greatest achievement that I think that he'll take credit for, uh, he's been married for 44 years and had three children and 11 grandchildren. Oh, just had another one this week. Make oh, that 12. I'm up there. You have 12. <laughs> and if you've ever been by the new Corps to Shore project, which is where the Ferris wheel is in Oklahoma City, one of his sons was looking at eBay, and this Ferris wheel came up on eBay at story. Monica Pier, California, and he had the insight to buy that Ferris wheel put it in storage, bring it in, upgrade it, and now it is a tourist attraction in South Oklahoma City. So he comes with a tremendous amount of, of engagement in his community, his schools, his churches, and we're pleased to have him. On my right, and if you'll notice in the program, there is his high school senior picture. Yeah. He still puts it there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't look, don't look. But uh, as I told you, a uh, fair while ago, I take credit for giving some of the birth, political birth to Mike Perfin. I was on the committee that looked at him to hire him as our police advisor in the state of Oklahoma back when he had an Afro haircut and he just got now, just big. got to that college. Big. And big Afro. Big blood. It turned around. Right but it turned Mike, right. Mike is a favorite son of every county in this state. I, I literally make that. Uh, he has made the conversion. He was our attorney general. Distinguished himself well. Uh, but he made the conversion politically, although he is probably one of the more politically active people, being one of the largest philanthropic uh, accumulators in the state of Oklahoma. Yeah. He will tell you this morning, I'll speak for him, when you ask him what the greatest nation on earth is, he will respond to you, it's a donation. Donation. So be very careful about approaching my turn. Because he will ask you for money. 
If you ain't giving, you ain't living. Yeah, you okay. Go. I can't help it. Uh, go ahead. The way it is. And I mean, you can run several buildings, don't want to set you off the energy of Mike Kirkland. So, <laughs> I mean, he is my friend, and I'm proud of him, and I, everybody who's ever been around him shares in his success and what he's done. He's known from coast to coast. But these two gentlemen have a TV show here every, every Sunday morning yeah. called Flashpoint. And uh, it's one of the entertaining political highlights. They're very serious about how they feel, yeah. but in the, in the nature of this great country, they disagree with a civil perspective. So with that, and in the pursuit of democracy as we know it, I'm going to go alphabetically and let them kind of start off with their thought on what happened last night. Uh, the sky's not falling. We're not going, everybody's not going anyplace. And let Kirk give his thoughts, then we'll go to Mike and we'll have an open discussion about the various issues that they think Oklahoma will have either opportunity or challenges for the coming years. Thank you. Thank you, Gene. Hey, it's great to be with you all this morning. Uh, I first got elected to office um, about 30 years ago uh, for, on school board, and I truly believe that school board and city council, city government and county government are the purest forms of public service because it's right where the people are. And most of you will not become rich and famous, but you're serving people, meeting their needs. So thank you. Mike and I are delighted to be with you and give yourselves a hand for that. Um, yeah, the world did not end about one o'clock last night, but it did for some people, I think. And I think I was watching a, a funeral on MSNBC about that, that point in time. Every fall, Mike and I come down and speak to David Boren's uh, president's leadership class, and we spoke to him about a month ago. Right. About 125 of the brightest new freshmen on the OU campus. And I asked him, I said, how many of y'all, I'm not asking how you're going to vote, how many of you think that Donald Trump will win the election? and one hand went up out of 125 kids. Yeah. So we're gonna do that with you all. How many of you all thought yesterday morning that Donald Trump would win the election? Okay. Mm -hmm. They asked me yesterday afternoon, I said, well, if you, I think Hillary's gonna win, but I give Donald Trump a 40% chance to win. That's the way I felt. And I think most of the experts didn't give him that much chance to win. But he, he proved something yesterday. And, um, I've been on the losing side before, and I can, I can remember when Lyndon Johnson got elected, and I didn't think we'd survived him, and I think we're still paying for it. So Medicare. And I can remember when Bill Clinton got elected, and I can remember when Barack Obama got elected, and I just thought the world would end. And, uh, and so the world is not going to end. The you know, stock market uh, is down about 1% in, on the futures. Um, but, you know, the truth is, the American people have not lost their minds. American businesses are worth as much today as they were yesterday. And so, you know, maybe, maybe you have a better opportunity to buy into American enterprise at a cheaper price this morning if the stock market stays down. But the world's going to change. Um, Donald Trump, I, I, and I voted for Trump, but I'm telling you reluctantly. Um, the things he said, the things he's written, the things he's done, the way he treated people. Um, boy, I just had a hard time getting there. And the, and the reason I voted for him is because there are many men and women who've given their lives to give us the right to vote. And I thought it would be a greater evil to not vote than to vote for a flawed candidate. So I voted for him, and I couldn't vote for Hillary. I really couldn't. So I voted for him, but reluctantly. And I think a lot of people felt that way. But I'll tell you, he touched a nerve that we'll do well to all learn from. Do you know that he, we assumed that he would do terrible with women, terrible with Hispanics. He did as well with women as Mitt Romney and John McCain did. He did as well, believe it or not, with Hispanics as Mitt Romney and John McCain did. He did better with the black voters than Romney and McCain. But where he won the election was with, with the white voter without a college degree. And he touched the nerve of discontent in that voter. And that's why 
He won Pennsylvania, and that's why he won Wisconsin. That's why he's probably going to win Michigan, and that's why he won the election. So we would do well to figure out what, it, what is the nerve that Trump touched, that Bernie Sanders touched. Uh, the voters are saying something to us, and, um, and we'd do well to figure that out. Um, but things are going to change. Obamacare is going to change. The Supreme Court is going to be different than it would have been had he not been elected. Will it be revolutionary? I don't think so. I, but I think you'll see Scalia replaced with a justice much more like Scalia than different than Scalia. And the truth is, uh, two out of the three people that are coming up next that might be leaving the court are on the liberal side. And it, the court's going to look different with a Trump president than a Hillary Clinton presidency. Uh, the second biggest shock of the day for me was the fact that David Bourne's tax plan went down. How many were surprised by that? Most of you were not surprised by that. Um, I'm on the board at OU, and uh, that, as far as I, I believe, that's David Bourne's first ever defeat at the ballot box. He was not the candidate, but his name was all over that. And so a long and distinguished career. I, I think probably the most powerful Oklahoman in my lifetime that's quite a statement. Um, and he went down to a 60-40 defeat yesterday. Um, what does that teach us? Well, one thing it teaches is I don't think we ought to make public policy in a small room with a very few people. And I think that's how that was put together. In fact, I know that that was how that, that was put together. Um, I think if you're wanting to make public policy and involve uh, people's pocketbooks, then uh, I think, particularly if you're going to change the state constitution forever with a permanent tax, I think you ought to really engage people out, out uh, far and wide. And, and uh, President Bourne did not do that and, to his detriment. Um, teachers need a pay raise. Uh, we, we want to adequately fund education, and I don't think we're doing it. But it, it's hard to get a tax increase. And I don't think that he adequately thought, how's that going to impact? If, if you're in a border county, how, how many of you all have a county sales tax? Let me see your hand. How many of you are in a border county with a county sales tax? How did you feel about how that would affect you if he raised sales tax? It's going to drive business across the state line, isn't it? So if you're the mayor of Ardmore or the mayor of Lawton or the mayor of Durant or the mayor of Ponca City, and I could go on and on and on, you're saying, you're killing me. And people like David Bourne would do well to, li to listen to the mayors and the county elected officials as, as they reach out to make public policy. So did our problems go away in education funding yesterday? No, they didn't. The need is still there. The need is real. But we need to address it together instead of uh, a few oligarchs getting together and figuring out what to do. So two big surprises for me. Great to be with you. Yeah. <clears throat> well done. I'm a proud Democrat, and there's fewer and fewer Democrats in Oklahoma, but I'm a proud Democrat. And I'm here to tell you that I tried to tell everybody that Hillary Clinton had no chance of winning. So I predicted that early on, that she was never going to win. And uh, that's kind of a joke. I kind of thought she might, to be honest with you. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I was trying to be a little bit funny. But no, no. I grew up in the Muskogee County Courthouse. And um, I learned that the highest office in the whole country is citizen. Just, just being a citizen. And America's 240 years old. Think about that, folks. That's, that's three times 80, three times my mother's age when she died. So America is still a very young experiment in democracy. We, we got to treat it with care. But the one thing we've learned more than anything else in 240 years is the pendulum swings back and forth. And I just want you to know this, that we've talked a lot about this on the show, Kirk, that in the last 75 years, since FDR, in fact, the same party has got a third term for the presidency 
one time, one time only. And you know what I'm talking about. That's Bush after Reagan, he got one term. Was the Democratic Party really going to get a third term after eight years of Barack Obama? History would tell you no chance. I will tell you, I think the Democrats thought they had a chance for a third term. And I want you to know this on a personal level. I believe in politics. You believe in politics. Personal contact alters opinions. Personal contact alters opinions. You get to know somebody, they get to know you. We find out every man, every woman is like a book, a volume. It will simply take the time to read them. Well, I got to know the Clintons. That's the honest to God truth. I got to know Bill Clinton a long time ago when I was attorney general here. My wife went to the University of Arkansas, for God's sakes. So in the year 2000, we had Hillary Clinton in our home, not too far from here, when she was running for U.S. Senate. And then she came back eight years ago in our home, not too far from here, Crown Heights. It's a Norman Rockwell painting come to life, our little neighborhood there in Oklahoma City. Yeah. She was in our home eight years ago when she was running for president. So I got to know her on a personal basis. For God's sake, she's a Girl Scout, literally. For the last 14 years, she's been, she's been selected 14 years straight as the most admired woman in the whole world. I know that's very hard for you to believe, given the fact we just went through the political campaign that we all just went through. But it's true. That's a Gallup poll. That's worldwide. It's a national vote, but who's the most admired woman in the whole world? Hillary Clinton for the last 14 years. Isn't that just amazing to think about all that? As a U.S. senator, she got elected with about 70% of the vote. As Secretary of State, Republicans like Condoleezza Rice said she did a great job. But you put Hillary in a political context, man, it didn't go so well. It didn't go so well. I couldn't believe it when Bill and Hillary Clinton told me they were going to run again. Let's be honest about it. I mean, for those that are getting older in the room, and look at me and Kirk, and I'll speak for you, Gene. <laughs> the people up here, we probably got more yesterdays in our life than we do tomorrow's. Yeah, no doubt Let's about think it. about that. No doubt about it. But, uh, hey, but we still got miles to go before we sleep. The poet would tell you that, too. Every one of you. All of us, too. But... Look at the presidential race. Hillary 69, Trump 70, and Bernie Sanders, the youth candidate, was 74. My own kids were saying, Dad, where's the next generation in all this? My own kids were saying, Bill and Hillary again? So I couldn't believe they wanted to run again, but when they did, I was there with them. And when my mother was 80 years old, I'll never forget, Bill Clinton called me. This is eight years ago. We'd carried the state about two to one for Hillary over Barack Obama. I'm talking Super Tuesday eight years ago. I'll never forget Bill Clinton called me and said, Mike, what can I do for you? I'm trying to, what can I do for you? And what would you say if Bill Clinton called you and asked you, what can I do for you? I didn't, I didn't know what to say, to be honest with you. But, well, my mother Marge lives up on Lake Fort Gibson in Wagner County, and she just turned 80 years old. Would you just call and wish your happy birthday? He goes, sure will, Mike. Give me that number. So about an hour later, my mother called me back and said, you won't believe what just happened. Bill Clinton just called and wished me happy birthday. One of the highlights of her life, to be honest with you. So it's okay to have friends in high places. Garth Brooks is right, too. It's good to have friends in low places. But <laughs> you, 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 you guys, what's my point? I got to know the Clintons. You know, so it's for them. They're friends of mine. And they're good folks. But it didn't work out. And I'm just going to say this to you. What were we thinking that we didn't understand the fact that Barack Obama says, here's Obamacare. You get to keep your doctor and your rates will never go up. What were we thinking when it didn't quite work out that way? What were we thinking, you know, when, uh, I'll just be real candid with everybody in this room, when marriage equality happened so quickly that some people's head are still spinning on a social issue like that. They can't quite get their head around the fact that gay rights have come so quickly in the eight years of Barack Obama, you know. What were we thinking, you know, Democrats I'm talking about, when you realize that there hadn't been no third term in 75 years, I told you a while ago. What were we thinking when, when you realized it really was Bill Clinton that pushed through NAFTA and, and believes in international trade? We'll see what Trump does, but the Democrats were the internationalists here. Last thing I want to say about all that. Do you realize only 5% of the world population lives in America? We're the greatest country in the whole world, but only 5% of the world population lives here, folks. If we, have, if we don't have some kind of international trade, we're just trading with each other. It won't work. But I think Trump did a good job of saying, wait a minute, too many jobs have gone overseas. I mean, he hit a nerve. To his credit, he hit a nerve and he played that well. What were us Democrats thinking that we couldn't explain NAFTA any better than we tried to do? When you look back on it, you realize Obama got his eight years. Was it really going to be a third term? No. 
No, no, there's not. We now know the answer to that question. So that's how it worked out. The beat goes on, miles to go before we sleep. This great democracy will continue. And Steve Russell, a great congressman, was on our show last week, and he said, let me tell you something. This country is greater than the two people running for president. He said, this, this country is bigger and greater than Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. In other words, whatever happens, this great country will survive and endure and go on. Indeed, it will. Last thing I want to say about what you just said on sales tax. I'm on Boren's side on that one. And Boren lost for the first time in his life. Get ready for Boren for governor. I don't mean Dan Boren. It could be David Boren. Kirk can respond to that. He knows him very well. But folks, my wife's a school teacher. And uh, she recently retired. But think about it, you guys. In Oklahoma City right now, you start... Your starting salary in Oklahoma City is 34000 The starting salary in Denton, Texas is 51000 I'm going to say it twice. Starting salary in Oklahoma City, 34000 Starting salary in Denton, Texas, $51,000. we are losing them across the Red River at record numbers. I don't know how you finance it, but at least Bourne had an idea, and it darn sure got well, beat. And then one, one last thing, educators impact eternity in your, in, in your city, in your county. I know you're all fighting for funding. But something's got to be done there. And so far, the only person that stood up and tried to do anything was Mary Fallon in her State of the State address. She goes, I want $5,000 for teachers. I want it paid for by the tobacco industry. And I want, you know, she tried, but his legislature didn't come through. So far, I mean, I'm not trying to be too critical here. No, so far, somebody's got to do something, though. So let's keep and, talking. And, and thanks for having us. And let me jump in on that real yeah, quick, Gene. On, on the uh, education issue. When Ron Norick, my predecessor as mayor, it, you all were in Oklahoma City 20 years ago. Well, you may not have been, really. Uh, but Oklahoma City in 1993 was dead. And a city councilman said in a city council meeting, downtown is dead and we killed it. And we were exporting our kids. We would educate them, we'd give them a college degree, and they would leave because they thought there was no opportunity here, and for most of them, there was not. And Ron Norick said, why don't we have a discussion among ourselves and decide, instead of paying people to come here, we offered United Airlines $100 million cash to put a maintenance facility there, and they turned us down because their rank and file people that they sent in for a sneak trip on a weekend said, you may move to Oklahoma City, but we're not going to because there's nothing to do there. And so Ron Norick led the city to tax themselves and invest in the most important things. And yeah, the first MAPS was 360 million. Since then, we've invested $2 billion in tax. The taxpayers have voted to tax themselves to get what they want. And then, you know what? Oklahoma City's pretty darn happy about that. In fact, the last poll they did where they said, has MAPS been good for Oklahoma City? It was 98% positive response, 98%. So we do have a problem in education funding I think we have a problem and we're not funding government in our state at a level that we want to do because even when oil was 100 bucks a barrel, we were having financial crises at the state, state capital. So something's not right. But we can solve that if we'll get together, rural and urban, Democrat and Republican, white and black, and talk to each other and say, what do we want Oklahoma to be? There's no excuse for Texas to be more prosperous than Oklahoma. We're the same people with the same land in the same air, Texas has had better leadership over the decades than we have. Let's just admit that. They've gotten things done that they needed to get done. We haven't, but we can. And we'll do it if we work together and tackle our issues. We can fix education. We can fix teacher salaries. We can fix it as Oklahomans working together, but we will not fix it if we just lob bombs at each other. And in, in essence, that's what I think David Bourne did. He did it because he thought he could. And the voters said, no, you can't. I just want you to know that Kirk's on the OU Board of Regents. Seriously. seriously. Yeah, I'm, I'm one of seven people who David Boren reports to, seriously. I, I guess you're talking to a guy that knows what he's talking about. Well, and he, he not, he's not going to run for governor. He, for heaven's sake, he's 75 years old, and he's not a young 75, so he's not running for governor. Uh, in, in, in defense of older people. In defense of older people. <laughs> Michelangelo was 73. When he painted the testing chapel. Yeah, but he was lying on his back. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, okay. what's your point? Give my point. 
for, you know, the, the political physics of what we saw last night, obviously going to have some effect in different parts of the country. To borrow a line from one of Mike's books, and Mike's a crawfish author, written at least two books. I bought both of them. But anyway. Uh, <clears throat> That's the only two I've sold. <laughs> <laughs> the state of Oklahoma historically has functioned off soil, oil, and toil. I'll let him get back to that. Yeah. Soil, oil, and toil. That's Oklahoma. One of the first, the, one of the first embracers of the Trump for presidency was Harold Hamm of Continental Research. Harold Hamm. As, as a product of that, it appears that Harold Hamm may be at the table as an advisor on energy. He will be, yeah. yeah. And as Oklahoma is so engaged in energy, to borrow on your comparison to Texas, what do you see as to the future of people like Harold Hamm, uh, our governor who also endorsed Trump Berlin. Uh All the enhancements come. I mean, I think that the people in, in this room who are elected officials understand that there is an advantage comes to who, who actually have the voice out there. Tinker Field probably is a product of a, a great delegation that worked on behalf of the state. Where do you see that? What do you? Uh, what effect do you think Harold Hamm can have for a positive impact on state of Oklahoma, or some of the rest of the people who are engaged in the process? I'll take the first shot at that. Uh, you know, we are an energy state. We we would we would like for our economy to be more diverse, and it's probably more diverse than it used to be. But we're an energy state, and uh, I think Harold Hamm. I, I promise you when energy policy is made at the White House, he'll be in the room. He, he'll, he will be sitting at that table. And um, we need a better federal energy policy. And um, I think Harold Hamm will, will help direct that. And so we, we can be energy dependent. We're very close to that right now. We can be totally energy independent. But federal policy has, has put a lot of constraints on which land we can drill on and even offshore. And we, we can do energy in a way that's that uh, fiscally makes sense and is ecologically sound. And I think Harold Hamm can help us do that. Yeah. He talked about Harold Hamm. Let me talk about Mary Fallon. Mary Fallon was early for Donald Trump. There's not a doubt in my mind that Mary Fallon could have a job, a high level job in a, in a Trump administration. Secretary of Agriculture? Secretary, I mean, just pick one. I mean, I don't know. I, I'm not sure how interested she is. Uh, I, I, know, uh, I know the governor well, as you all do. I know Wade Christensen better, the man from Thomas, Custer County. In fact, I'm having lunch with him Thursday. We have lunch quite a bit. I enjoy the first gentleman. I enjoy staying in touch with him. I'm not sure how bad they want to go to Washington. They really do love Oklahoma. But Mary Fallon could have a top job in a Trump administration. That's an absolute fact. What if she left? Oh, my gosh. The lieutenant governor would become governor automatically. So keep thinking about things like that because you guys are all – Everybody in this room, we're students of politics. We're also participants, but we're students of the game. And that's going to be a fun one to watch, what Mary Fallon does in a Trump administration, if anything. She'll certainly have the opportunity. Well, and, and Mary Fallon, I promise you'll be looking at what do I do if I don't do that, because she is in her second term, and the end is near. And where do you go from there? She, she was in Congress, really didn't like Washington that much. So I don't know what she'll do, but... But she, she has a different perspective now than she had eight or, eight or ten years ago because she's at the end of her second term and there's nothing left politically in Oklahoma for her to do. She'd have to go to Washington, and I don't know if she wants to do that as far as running for office. Yeah. And there's no U.S. Senate race, you know, just yet. So that's, that's going to be fun to watch, folks. And, and then Bob Mills, the furniture man. Everybody says he'll be a Repo Governor, next time, everybody says, obviously, Todd Lamb, maybe Scott Pruitt, your attorney general. Maybe Breitenstein, the congressman for Trump. And Bob Mills, watch him, the furniture well, man, because he was early for Trump in Oklahoma. It'll and be I, fun I, to see. I think the door opened last night for Dan Bourne, quite frankly. Dan Bourne for governor? Well, if, if, if Donald Trump, if, if Hillary had won, I think Dan Bourne's path to run for governor would be more difficult. With Trump winning, in Oklahoma, I think it's only one time in my lifetime, if you had an open seat in the White House, an open seat in the governor's mansion, only one time in my lifetime has the same party won. And that was 
1978, George Nye, after Jimmy Carter got elected. Other than that, Oklahoma goes against the national uh, uh, election two years later. Let me, let me so just, that opens it up for Dan Bourne. Yeah, very well put. I totally agree. With, let, let, me, let me take a stab at that. There's not anybody in this room, Republican or Democrat, that hadn't said something about that doggone Barack Obama. I said, I said something like that, yeah. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Kirk had a flat tire two days ago. He goes, Obama's fault. He blamed it on Obamacare. Okay, okay. Just kidding, of course. But my point is, whoever's in the White House, we, we, we find a way to get mad at them. I mean, come on. So Trump's in the White House now? That's going to help Democrats in Oklahoma. Mike, he's not going to offend anybody. He's not going to offend anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but Kirk's on to something. If Hillary's in the White House, I'm not sure Democrats could, get, could ever get elected to state office again in Oklahoma because everybody would be mad at Hillary like they are Obama. Now they're going to be mad at Trump. Hear me now. Believe me later. The next governor of the state of Oklahoma will, in fact, be a Democrat. I don't know who, but it'll be a Democrat. I never thought I'd say that because I thought Hillary would probably win. That's what it looked like. But right now, that matters to all of us. And, and Mike, I'm not Todd sure. Todd Lamb don't, won't believe what I just said. But, I'm not I sure I agree too. with you, but I'm just saying if with Trump in the White House, and let's, let's say the Republican nominee is Todd Lamb, who knows who it'll be? Todd, Todd will make a good run at it, I promise you that. Yeah. Let's say it's Todd Lamb. And let's say the Democratic nominee is Dan Boren. That's a heck of a race because there are a whole lot of Republicans who like Dan Boren. And there are probably a lot of Democrats that like Todd Lamb. That's right. And, 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 I'll just tell you, if either of those two men were elected governor, our state would be well served. So there's not a bad choice in that. A lot different than what we were looking at last night. Things change quickly, folks. Things change quickly. Hey, hey, at his 80th birthday party, Robert Frost. Gene, you've lost control of this yeah. thing. But w w one Robert Frost story. Robert Frost turned 80 years old, and the great American poet. And they ask him, what have you learned in 80 years? He said, just three words. Life goes on. Yeah. And that's where I am this morning, folks. That was tough last night, but life goes on. And uh, then, both of you are historians. We've, we've proven that. <laughs> yeah, so, we're, yeah. You know, if we go back to our great 16th president of the United States. Okay. Abraham Lincoln, he made the famous statement, a house divided against itself can I stand. So where do we go from your perspectives? And I want to throw one more wild card in. Is there any doubt in anyone's mind that the winner last night was actually a third party candidate outside the mountain no, that's, mainstream no, of both that's, parties? That's true, that's true. And as a third party candidate, how do they step forward and they've got a task on both sides. They don't just have a task on one side. You want to take first? Yeah, yeah, I do. I need your help on this one, folks. My wife has taught school for about 25 years. I met her when she was teaching school in Oklahoma City at Emerson Alternative School, the school for pregnant teenagers. She's always helped people that were disenfranchised and kind of underprivileged and on the downside of life to a certain extent. Her last job was U.S. Grand High School, which is 60% Hispanic. She fell in love with her students. They came early. They stayed late. They had a good work ethic. She helped them get jobs. She helped them get scholarships. She helped place them in colleges all over the state of Oklahoma. And the email she was getting this morning from her students over the last 25 years that she's taught, they're, they're worried. They're concerned. I'm just sharing with everybody in this room, if, if you know anybody that is a person of color, for God's sakes, reach out to them. Reach out to them. Kind of a scary time for them. I'm not saying Trump's going to come after everybody. I think a lot of that was rhetoric. I understand politics. So do you. You say what you got to say to get elected. I think that's a lot of what Trump did. But it scares people. And, and if you're a Muslim in this country, ladies and gentlemen, we got 380 Muslim doctors in Oklahoma City. We got 400 Muslim doctors in Tulsa. Muslim doctors are keeping us alive for God's sakes. Trump can say what he wants to say, but somebody needs to reach out to these people and say, you're Americans too. Whatever he said, we're all in this thing together. And hopefully he doesn't mean exactly what he said. Maybe he does, I don't know. It sure hit a nerve and I get that. And my dad would have voted for Trump. Let me assure you that. He was, he was a Nixon Republican. My mother was a very left of center Democrat. But so I kind of understand what's going on. I knew how my daddy thought. And my daddy did think there was too doggone much immigration happening too darn quickly. And I think that scares a lot of people. 
But the ones that are here now, come on, folks. It's got to be we instead of me. I mean, we got to reach out a little bit. I think Trump will too, by the way. I think Trump will too. All right, you, your comment about a third-party candidate is, is really right on, Gene. I, I, uh, let's face it, both parties have lost touch with Americans. And, uh, and so we had a third-party guy run and win the Republican nomination. None of us gave Donald Trump any chance. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, I, I called Barack Obama on Flashpoint one day. I called him a clown. And uh, people just got all offended about it. And I've called Trump a clown. I called him a clown yesterday. Now I'm calling him Mr. President. But, uh, <laughs> but he was not our candidate. In essence, he, was, he is a third-party candidate. So what does that mean? It means that the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, if they want to stay in power and be effective, had better reconnect with the American people. And that's what Donald, Donald Trump said, something's not right here, and he put his finger on it. And the truth is, Bernie Sanders did the same thing. And the people with Brexit in Britain did the same thing. All of these votes are saying, basically, Chuck Todd in NBC said one day, what Donald, Donald Trump speaks the words that people are thinking when they want to throw the shoe at the television set. Yeah, let me, Kirk Pe People were mad, and last night they got even. Yeah, that's right. And, and we'll do well to figure out what is on their heart. Yeah, yeah my one-liner, folks, and I mean this sincerely, is I think Donald Trump practiced what I call middle finger politics. And I'm not trying to be funny. I mean, he, he, he's saying to hell with everybody. Kirk's heard me say this. Do you realize there was 57 national newspapers endorsed Hillary Clinton, most of which the Cincinnati paper, the Dallas paper, the Houston paper, the Arizona paper, had never endorsed a Democrat their whole life. That's how afraid they were, the opinion makers of Donald Trump. Now, he but no one knew it because no one's buying their papers anymore, Mike. Well, no, 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 that, that, that's, well, they say the obituary for the American newspaper has been written, but there's nowhere to print it. So they got their problems, that's right. But, but you, I, I'm, I'm just saying that middle finger politics. I mean, he, he was saying, I'm mad as hell and I'm not taking it anymore. You saw the movie. I mean, that's kind of where he was. And my serious point is this. Populism is popular until it gets elected. And then you got to govern. I wish him the best. I do, think, I do think he'll put people, good people in around him. I'm not sure he'll listen to the good people he puts in around him, but I hope he does. Mike, I, I would say this. Um, last night, about 8 o'clock, I watched the national media experiencing a death in the family. Yeah, yeah. And you could see it, crum in fact, I could see it come across Mike's face. Our, we, our first cut in that we did about 7.30, yeah. he thought Hillary was gonna win. I did. About 30 minutes That's later, true. Florida started going the other way and I could see it come across my, look in the eyes. Yeah. You can see it come across their face. I was gonna be an ambassador. And, and so. No, just kidding, J just kidding. I'm so we, 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 were watching, we, we were watching NBC News at midnight last night, and you know, Lester Holt's going, well, we don't know the outcome yet, and I'm going, Lester, wake up and smell the coffee. Yeah. It's over. Yeah. The only one that had any sense in that thing was Savannah Guthrie. She, she, she got it, but the rest of them were still in denial. They probably, they probably think it's still a race this morning. I don't know. But... Last weekend, when Trump was, like on Saturday, Trump made five states in one day. You know, he was in Florida, and he was in Pennsylvania, and he was in Michigan. And, and the, and the smart people on TV said, Donald Trump obviously doesn't know what he's doing. Hillary Clinton has her ground game going. Donald Trump's running around the country looking for a vote. Well, I think he knew what he was doing, don't you? And so the media has painted this, and quite frankly, the establishment, people like me, and the media have painted Trump as a lecherous dunce. A lecherous dunce. A lecherous dunce. And they're only half right. He is no dunce. The first part might be true. So he's the moral equivalent of Bill Clinton. Lecherous, but a smart guy. And that he knew exactly what he was doing, and he pulled off. Let's say he won that election. Not only he won Florida and North Carolina, he had to in Ohio. He won Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. And he'll win Michigan, too. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's when he was jetting around, and when they were saying he was stupid. He wasn't stupid. Mm -hmm. 
he had his pulse on the voters. And, and Gene's right. He was turning out big crowds all year long. And Hillary was scratching to get 300 people there. So the guy's on to something. And I think that if people think he's stupid, I think they're making a mistake. Don't sell the guy short. We've sold him short. And he's the winner. And our guys weren't. Everyone, I, if I gave money to a Republican candidate this year, he was out of the race within a week. So, you know, um, and so I, I think he will govern a lot smarter than people give him credit for. Well, you compared him to Bill Clinton, and I hope he gives us the same eight years of peace and prosperity that Bill Clinton gave America. I hope he does. So uh, I hope that comparison's true. Hey, let me give you a philosophical note here. Uh, I have two sons and a daughter, and I look at the world through my daughter's eyes. I look at the world through Sarah's eyes, and it makes me appreciate every woman in this room that builds bridges and knocks down barriers for my little girl. And that's one of the reasons I was excited about a Hillary Clinton presidency. And that's not going to happen. That's over. But I appreciate every woman that's ever knocked down a barrier or built a bridge for my little girl. So, so there's not going to be a woman president yet, but it could be your daughter. And uh, I want to keep hope alive for women. No, women in the be. highest places, including our governor and including Joy Hoffmeister, who's yeah. somewhat in battle right now. But she's the only champion the students have in the state right now, as well as the teachers. And there, Educators impact eternity. There, there will be a woman president. Yeah. And, um, but let's face it, Hillary was a terribly flawed candidate. I hope they have a better shot at it next time. Better, yeah. Someone who doesn't have as much baggage. He's still beating up on Hillary. You won. Congratulations. Trump's your man. Leave Hillary alone for God's sakes. Go and praise Donald Trump. He'll make you an ambassador. All You're right. somebody. We're Leave gonna, Hillary alone. It's right. over, folks. We're going to give you the ball. Okay. I want you to put your attorney's hat on. Okay. I'm ready. According to the data analytics that we've been listening to now for nine days, it's reported that 77% okay. of the population... Is female? Yeah. Minority? Okay. Minority. Okay. With, what, let me finish. With, with, the, with what happened last okay. night. Okay. The framers of the Constitution put checks and balances as far as public law is concerned and policy and some other issues. So I want you to think through this from, a, from your litigation back. How hard it is to change in effect, even if the fear was, was real that someone was outside the mainstream of the ideals of the rest of the population, how difficult it would be to govern outside those lines? Hard question. Get ready, Kurt. But I, I, do, I do want you to know this. I'm not sure I'm answering your question directly. But think about this. Here's, here's how much America is changing demographically. And I think it's one of the reasons Trump won. And, and I respect this a lot. Uh, let me just be candid with you. The next four years will be good for white guys. I worry about a lot of other people. Just what you're pointing out. Here's the demographics of America. Out of the last six presidential elections, the Democrats have won five, now maybe six, popular votes. Clinton won two. Gore beat Bush on one. Obama won two. And now it looks like Hillary's going to win the popular vote without winning the presidency because she'll lose the Electoral College. You kind of see where I'm going with that? Demographically, the Democrats are on a roll with the popular vote in America. It is a changing America. There's no question about it. So it's a refrain from me now that we're all in this thing together. And at the Main Street Cafe somewhere in the great state of Oklahoma, I mean, I've been there. So has Kirk. I mean, that's what we love about this state is you go to a bean dinner, a fish fry, a Lions Club ladies night. You go to that diner. And that's where I see Oklahomans really kind of getting along pretty well. Across party lines, across color lines, across economic lines. We just got to keep doing more of that. And we're, we're all in this thing together. And I'm not trying to say... Like Hillary said, stronger together. That didn't work out so well. I'm just saying in Oklahoma. To heck with the national picture. In Oklahoma, 
You know, we're all in this thing together. And we'll, we'll make it work. I feel better about Oklahoma than I do anywhere because I think we all kind of got it figured out. We really do. A rising tide lifts all boats. That's it. Uh, and my comment would be, was it 77%, 78% are, are either, either women or minority or millennials? Um, I, I think in the implication of the question is that that's not Trump's demographic. Now, I, I don't know if that's what you no, meant, no, but, no. but that's the way I'm reading it. And uh, I think it's more complicated than that. As, as we get into what really happened yesterday with the exit polling and so on, what we're going to find is that not all women voted like other women. That's right. Not all uh, minorities uh, not all Hispanics voted like others. I, I was astounded that Trump did as well with Hispanics as Mitt Romney did and as John McCain did. Because we've been assuming that he was so offensive in his uh, comments about immigration that, that he'd do far, far worse. And he did the same. And so, uh, and, and I... I think that, and this is going to sound offensive, but by definitions, when you talk about minorities, that means there's fewer of them. And so while we need to reach out, and I, I, I've, I've, I've been out front as a Republican saying our immigration policy is broken and we can't just put all the Hispanics on Mexicans on buses and send them back. If we did, they'd come in the same way they came in last time we need to fix our immigration system. And, and quite frankly, I think we need to be compassionate to the person who's a stranger in our land, if I can put it that way. Uh, you know, if, if, if we're Christians and believe the Bible, that's what the Bible would teach. And, and so, are we people of law and order? Yes. But are we people of compassion? We should be. So, um, but I'll tell you, the millennials are the great, unknown uh, quantity and I think yesterday I think they'll find a lot of millennials voted for Donald Trump so we don't know on that one most of them voted for Bernie Sanders let's be honest about that yeah. well I, I think that everybody understands the millennials were activated for Bernie Sanders yeah. but again I think it goes back to the, both of them were third party candidates yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, hey, let, let me give you just a piece of this higher ed thing uh, Millennials, you, you mentioned them. I've got to be careful here. I'll get off on a rant. But 71% uh, of all the people in America last year, 71% of all the people in America last year that graduated with a four-year degree had student debt. Student debt. Yeah. Average debt about 37000 Not buying new cars, not buying new houses. They're deferring their marriages. That's, that's what Bernie Sanders tapped into. And, and, and Trump, Hillary was listening to him, and, and I, I hope the Trump administration will too. Got to help these young people, these millennials you're talking about with the student debt issue. It's, it's a crisis. 1.3 trillion in American student debt, more than the collective credit card debt added together. You get a degree in one hand and a ball and chain around your ankle. Yeah, I'm a higher could, ed Mike, region. I believe in higher ed, but that, that's an issue we've got to keep working on. We, yes. we can do a better job of not necessarily paying the debt for them. We, we can do a better job of helping them to not ever incur the debt in the first place. If, if a child graduates from Oklahoma City Public Schools, or I think Western Heights also, they can go to Oklahoma City Community College tuition free and book free for two years. And they can get their basics out of the way and then they, they can finish at UCO or OU. And, and, and so we could help them incur, we could help them uh, a lot by just helping them understand to not incur the debt in the first place, but that's not what universities and colleges are doing. They're, they're saying, oh, sure, we can do this, this, and that, and sign the paper. And the kid doesn't realize what he's doing. And the parents may not. I think now they're starting to figure it out. Yeah, it's financial literacy is what we're talking about here. Yeah. You guys, I grew up in North Tulsa. I went to McLean High School. I waited tables for five years at Steak and Ale to, to, to pay along the way. So I did to my go to college. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm saying I still had to borrow a little bit of money, even though I was working five nights a week at Steak and Ale as a waiter. You know, I still had to borrow a little bit of money to go to college. For people to achieve the American dream, as we say, a little bit of college along the way. I like what you said. I like what they're doing. Tulsa Chiefs has the same thing. Two years for free up there in Tulsa County. That needs to be statewide. 
that was one of Hillary's visions as well, and I, I think it'd be well for the Secretary of Education for Donald Trump to look at things like that. Two years free all over the state of Oklahoma, all over the country, perhaps. Anyway, what else? Okay, well, I want to ask Kurt a personal question. Uh, We're going to get personal now. Yeah, well, it's a, you know, it's, it's a positive person. The people in this room represent historically very rural areas out in the state of Oklahoma. They're seeing declining populations, they're seeing declining health care, they're seeing a lot of other things. But they're always looking for those visionaries that have more of a, uh, a positive attitude about where it's going. I know that Kirk, for example, has made a major investment on the border of Pittsburgh and McIntosh County. Uh, and he can tell you about it. What led you to make, a, to make an investment in rural Oklahoma in the middle of oil crisis, declining the economy, yeah. against virtually swimming upstream yeah. or downstream like a sand? I'll take a stab at that. Um, my son is the town founder and developer of Oklahoma's newest municipality is called Carlton Landing. It's in Pittsburgh County. Uh, it was incorporated in 2013 with, uh, I don't know, 25, 30 voters. Um, it, it's, um, it's on Lake Eufaula in a county where I, I don't know off the top of my head what the average, the median home price is in Pittsburgh and McIntosh County, but I would guess $70,000 or some, some number like that, 70 to 100, somewhere in that range. Uh, they're selling homes um, for 225 bucks a square foot, and the average home goes for about $400,000. Uh, and we have, right now, we have, we're about four years into it as far as people living there. We have uh, about 130 homes that are completed and sold, and it's master plan for 3,000 homes. Uh, he hired the town planner that did Seaside, Florida, and uh, so the best town planner in the world. And they've come up with this great plan, and they're attracting, uh, typically, uh, well-to-do people from Oklahoma City area, Tulsa area, some out of Dallas, some out of Arkansas, and then some from across the state. Why would I do that? Uh, we've had a home at Lake Eufaula for years, and uh, this is the truth, and it's not going to sound very smart. Uh, in 2007, I was looking for a place to land my airplane. I went down to Lake Texoma, and I landed on a grass strip on the Texas side of Lake Texoma, and they, around this grass strip, they had these little cabins on stilts, and I thought, that's cool. And I went back and Googled, land for sale, you follow Oklahoma, and I hit on some land a mile from my lake house. And it turns out it's not very good to land an airplane on. It's hilly and... Uh, but I put it under contract, and I drove my son over there, Grant, and I said, hey, look at this land. And he goes, you know, Dad, I think we could develop this. So I'm not the visionary. I'm just the guy looking for a place to land my airplane. And um, we bought the land. It, by the time we bought it, it was 2008. The economy's going down. Um, we bought 1,600 acres. Um, and we paid um, for the land about $4 million. We got some investors and we wound up raising $14 million with no debt. And so when, in 2009 and 10, during the downturn, we were able to do our first phase of development and pay for our land all with no debt because we knew no banker would loan us the money. Um, we last year distributed uh, a small return to our investors. So that's uh, six years into it before they got a penny out. We think it'll be a good investment in the long term, but it's not been easy. And so, if we, Gene, if we'd known what we were doing, we never would have done it. Um, but I, I tell you this, um, as Oklahomans, we ought to do better than we're doing. I'm back to my Texas talk here, but we ought to do better than we're doing, but you do better if you make investment. And we have, we have good people, we have beautiful land, and uh, that land's been sitting there since God made it, but no one ever invested the money to put in the infrastructure uh, to get the value out of it. So land that I bought for six cents per square foot, we're selling for $16 per square foot. Now, before you get all excited about that, there's a whole lot that went in, on in between those two numbers. But rural Pittsburgh County 
were selling home sites for 10 to, 10 to 15, 16 dollars per square foot. And so that's changing the economics in Pittsburgh County. Um, still a poor county, but, uh, but there's some, some bright things on the horizon. We have the first rural charter school in the state. Uh, a couple of years ago when it was part of the Canadian school district, it was ranked number one out of over 1,700 schools in the state on the state test, number one. So a lot of good things, but um, uh, we're gonna have to invest money if we, if we wanna change our state. And, and sometimes we invested on the government side, sometimes we invested on the private side. And I, and I, yeah, and I enjoy, Kirk says a lot that we can't cut our way to prosperity. No. I, mean, I appreciate you saying that. He's saying governmentally or otherwise. I mean, every once in a while we gotta have more resources, well, more money. You, you know, you know city, we, county, state. Like I say, people celebrate the renaissance in Oklahoma City, but that was made on the back of the Oklahoma City taxpayer. And quite frankly, a lot of you folks, if you come to the city, we get your money. So 30, 30 cents out of every dollar that went in the, in the maps was paid by people that don't live there, people visiting. But those, the people of Oklahoma City have taxed themselves $2 billion in the last 20 years to make that happen. And that kind of cooperation and that kind of wise investment, strategic investment, can work anywhere. And we're seeing it happen at Carlton Landing. We've seen it happen in Oklahoma City. It needs to happen around the state. We really need to say, if we were gonna fix three problems, what would we choose? Okay, now how are we gonna fix it? And we can fix it, but we'll only fix it if we work together and if we address our most important problems and if we sacrifice. Let me be philosophical for a second in closing here. Uh, Susan and I teach a Sunday school class back up in Oklahoma City. It's, it's the confirmation class, so seventh and eighth graders, kind of a rite of passage. And what we teach them is what I call the 4F club. There's different kinds of 4F club, and you know what I'm saying. But this is faith, family, and friends. All that matters in life is faith, family, and friends. Faith, we all decide for ourselves, right? Just don't be a spiritual spectator. Separate the ever fleeting from the everlasting, right? Faith, family. I got a great family, you do too. A quick one-liner, Susan and I have a perfect marriage. I don't try to run her life, I don't try to run mine either. She just, she's the CEO of the Turpin household, she takes care of everything. And what are the most important three-word statements, Mike? Thank you, Kirk set me up here, but you guys need to hear this. Five three-word phrases every man should use to ensure matrimonial bliss. You guys need to get this now. Five three-word phrases every guy here should use to ensure matrimonial bliss. Number one, I love you. Number two, you look beautiful. Number three, let's eat out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Number four, can I help? And number five, it's my fault. You guys got to get that down. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. There you go. See, that's good. Thank you, Kurt. So faith, family, friends, right? When I got beat for governor, a few good friends came walking in when everybody else went walking out. Don't ever walk past an old friend to shake hands with a new friend. That's what I learned. The kids in the class always go, well, you just said faith, family, and friends. What's the fourth F? Faith, family, friends, and, of course, finances. To support your faith, to take care of your family, to have fun with your friends, you've got to have a job. You've got to have money. Where I'm headed with this is the quality of life I had in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Not Tulsa, not Oklahoma City, but Muskogee, Oklahoma, with my friend Gene Wallace, was the best quality of life I've ever had in my whole life. What we have going out there in the 77 counties of Oklahoma is unique and special and wonderful. So thanks for having us here today. We appreciate it very much. Okay, I'm going to ask you one, oh, one personal question. Well, what was and personal? A, well, and then a final question for both of you. Okay. You have become legendary uh, turning the disaster on home city into a more policy and a role model for tragedy throughout the rest of the world. Yeah. I'd like for you to share with uh, the leaders this morning what you and your group have done with the with the bombing tragedy, the museum, the, the, the kids' engagement with public education, and the lesson on this Do you know where you were when the bomb went off 21 years ago in Oklahoma City? It's one of those moments, isn't it? So he's asking me a quite my current effort in life in the community. Kirk's got a lot, Gene's got a lot, you got a lot. You know, got to make a living, but we also got to make a difference. Make a living, make a difference. Vocation, avocation. Vocation's your job. Avocation's what you 
choose to do in the community, at your church or at the Lions Club or whatever. My current, not vocation, I'm a lawyer, you know, avocation, what I choose to do in the community is I'm chair of the Oklahoma City National Memorial Museum. So what Gene's asking me about is what we're doing there on that sacred ground. Have you ever been to the Oklahoma City National Memorial Museum? If you, let me know if you have, just kind of a few. Thank you. It's totally renovated. Come back if you haven't been there lately. Come if you've never been there. It, it's a powerful story. 20 in, 21 years ago when the bomb went off in Oklahoma City, President Clinton came to Oklahoma City and said, Oklahoma City, you broke our hearts, but you lifted our spirits. Based on how we reacted, it was called the Oklahoma Standard, how we all pulled together. Frank Keating was the governor, did a good job pulling everybody together. We turned our darkest hour into our finest hour. Think about that in your own life. Think about that in your own life. Every once in a while, we all got to turn our darkest hour into our finest hour, whatever is happening in your life. That's what that is symbolic for, the memorial and the museum. We went from recovery to resilience to renaissance. Ladies and gentlemen, in closing, thank you, Gene. You can tell I feel strongly about this. The bookends on the Oklahoma City renaissance are the bombing 21 years ago, how we reacted. You can't always control what happens to you, but you can control how you react to it how we reacted, how we pulled together, the Oklahoma Standard. And about eight, nine years ago, the thunder came to town. And our Sam Presti, the general manager, brings every Thunder employee and every Thunder player through the Oklahoma City Memorial Museum every year. He's on our executive committee. We're going to honor him Monday at a luncheon, in fact. Sam Presti, the general manager of the Thunder. He wants those players to see this sacred ground, the heart and soul of Oklahoma City. Between those bookends, the bombing and the thunder coming to town, was maps one two, and three, which Kirk Humphreys was right in the middle of doing, rebuilding Oklahoma City. So it does show you in your life, in our life, as a city, as a person, as a county, you can turn setbacks into comebacks. You can turn your darkest hour into your finest hour. Thanks for asking. Okay. Final question. I think we're all in agreement that we're at a crossroads of history. This will, this will be written in the history books that people will read through. And how fortunate we are to have both of you here this morning on this day. Both of you are, are, are here, deep thinkers and I know you want to memorialize for your family for the future what happened to I don't know that you keep a journal, but if you do keep a journal, Kirk, what would you write in that journal as of this day to share with this group that they can share in their memory as to where they were and the reaction to what happened last night? Well, I've tried to keep a journal numerous times and I get about two pages into it and then it goes stale. Um, you know, I, Gene, I don't know the, 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 what, what comes to mind. I think this went dead. Here we go. Hello. Okay. What comes to mind is uh, I think there's a knee-jerk reaction by a lot of people to think the world has ended. Uh, and I admit, I've, I heard him talking on the radio driving down, President Trump, and I'm thinking, that's a strange sounding, but, it, you know, President Obama sounded strange to me. He, President Clinton sounded strange to me. I kind of liked President Reagan. That, that had a good ring, but, you know, we get used to that. Um, and so what I would say is the world has not ended. The American people have spoken. That's what I would say. Um, and um, I, I want to I go back to your last question, uh, talking about the bombing. When I was mayor, I, I used to get the question, has the bombing been good for Oklahoma City? And my answer was, no mayor of Oklahoma City is ever going to say the bombing was good for Oklahoma City. But I think our response to the bombing was good for Oklahoma City. Because I think we, had a, we have a character among our people that we didn't realize we had until the bombing revealed it. Our response to the bombing revealed it. And if there's one characteristic of the city that explains its renaissance over the last uh, 20 plus years, its unity. And I believe that unity came out of the bombing because when we were attacked, we were no longer white and black, north side, south side, Democrat, Republican. We were Oklahoma Cityans and we were together and we have stayed together. 
Um, now I'm going to tell you a personal story. Um, I resigned at the mayor's office in 2004, 2003 to run for U.S. Senate. Had the good fortune to run at the same time Tom Coburn ran, so he had to go to Washington. I got to come back home after he roundly defeated me. Um, and a couple of years later, uh, after Mick Cornett had been elected, um, Mick decided he wanted to run for Congress, and he was going to run for mayor and get reelected and then run for Congress, and I, I kind of didn't like that, and I told him that. And uh, he ran for mayor in March and then in July filed for Congress. And it really ticked me off. And, uh, and so I was thinking about running against him for mayor. And um, Clay Bennett, you know Clay Bennett, the managing partner of the Thunder. Clay Bennett came to me uh, with another man, and he said, you know, I want to talk to you about that, about the idea of running against the sitting mayor, and I was the past mayor. He said, don't do that. He said, you know, for at that time, maybe 15 years, for 15 years we've been unified, and if you do that, people are going to have to choose either you or Mick, and you're going to break the unity that we've had, and we'll never get it back. He said, you know, probably you won't win. And probably your sons will be better off if you don't run, because if you run, they can't do business here in the city. If, if you don't, then they can do business in the city. He said, but more than anything else, don't do that, because you'll sacrifice the unity that, that we've achieved. And I slept on it, and I thought, you know what? He's right. He, he, he was a friend who gave me a good word that I needed to hear. And um, so as Oklahomans, I would say it's more important for us to be unified than for me to be right. So when, when you go back home and you're in an argument with somebody, remember, it's more important for us to be unified than to win the argument. In your county, if you're going to move your county forward, you really can't have a bunch of strife in the relationships. You've got to be unified. And, and if, if we'll put that as the most important value that we want to achieve, more important than Democrat, Republican, more important than me winning an election, more important than me winning this issue, whatever it is, relationships with people and be unified so that together we can work to move our, our city, our county, our state forward, then we'll be a better place. Well done. Hey, Kirk made me mad a little bit a while ago when he took off on Hillary because she's, it's over. And so I said, wait a minute, you won, you know, and it was a little bit spontaneous on my part. I kind of thought, come on, man. She, she's, she's quit it's beating an easy up. Target. Yeah, I know, I know. Quit beating up on the woman here. You know, I like strong women at the highest level. My point is, Kirk and I are on the opposite sides of a lot of issues. We, we can talk about those school teachers all day long. I mean, he wants to help them, and, but I want to help them right now. And, but I guess we're going to help them later if we help them at all. I don't know. But, but the point is, and we can argue all day long about Trump and Clinton, and, but we're friends. We're friends. You can't antagonize and persuade at the exact same moment. You know, to get something done, I like what you said, everything you said, Kirk, about cooperation. So, so we disagree passionately, but I love the guy. You know, we're friends. That can happen. It can work that way. David Walters beat me for governor. He stole my dream. Now, my mother was mad at him for a long time, but I got over it. David Walters and I are friends. I talked to David yesterday. We're good friends. He's helped me. I've helped him. The guy that beat me for governor. I mean, life goes on, folks. You turn the page. You write another chapter. You keep going. We're all in this thing together. God bless the county commissioners of the great state of Oklahoma. Seriously. Thanks for having us here today. I'm very grateful.